Okay, it's Thursday morning. Uh, it's just after 10 o'clock now, and it's stupidly hot here. It's really, really warm. I uh, just had a 7 Eleven breakfast sitting on the edge of the footpath, or sidewalk, and um, <clears throat> just sitting in the shade. It's trying to cool down, it is so hot here. Um, and when I got up this morning, I just completely lost all motivation for this, not, not interest in it. I just I love being here. And it's really interesting. This, uh, I'm, I'm seeing tweets and Facebook updates from uh, friends of mine that are here for the first time, and I love how excited they are and how they get up really early and queuing and doing all this stuff. And I was at for or I was like that for a few years, but now I just I, I just don't really want to queue. Um, I'm still interested. I still love being here. So the plan was, uh, well there was no plan, but I was thinking of maybe going to the Geek and Sundry Lounge. Uh, Felicia Day is doing a Q&A and a signing, I think at 10 o'clock. But uh, I just, again, I couldn't be bothered queuing for that. Uh, people think, there are people saying they need to be there about 8 to start queuing. Um, I wasn't going to do any panels today at all. Um, Hall Heach is not very interesting today, uh, for me anyway. And I've seen some Facebook updates now from um, the SDCC blog saying that there's hardly anyone in the queue, that they're letting people in and it hasn't even filled the tents yet. So it's very strange that the queue for Hall H basically <laughs> didn't happen. Uh, after all the people queuing up all night, I don't know what they're trying to get in for. I suppose they get up front, so that's something, but it just seems like Hall H isn't very popular today at all. But I might try for a uh, talk about uh, fan fiction, or people starting off in fan fiction and then getting into TV. Uh, there's a few people in that panel that, I've, that I know who they are. Uh, one of them is somebody who started writing Xena fan fiction and then got into writing TV shows. And somebody else is somebody who wrote on Xena. She did Valentine's Day and a few films as well. And she's involved in Army Wives. So I'll probably. Uh, it's starting in about an hour, so I will not see if there's much of a queue for that. I don't think that's going to be a popular one. Hopefully just get in and uh, see what that panel's like. Just one of the smaller panels, it's in a very small room. Well, I was just walking there, I just randomly bumped into uh, Brian Cooney. And, uh, yeah, again, I just, he's one of those people, no matter, every year I just seem to randomly see him or bump into him. And um, with all the thousands and thousands of people that are here. And then uh, afterwards I've seen Phil Plate from the Bad, he writes a Bad Astronomy blog. So um, I'm usually in my own my world, I never really spot anyone or see anyone. But that was just a random two people back to back. Um, the Ballroom 20 line is non-existent. <laughs> which is uh, very strange. If, if this stuff about Hall H is, is right, then it seems like nobody's in Ballroom 20 or Hall H today. Um, I'll go down here just to see if that's true, because that would be why the exhibition floor is crazy, which is what I'm hearing. And, and 24, again, I think is a little different than most shows. I do a lot of other shows. Uh, especially, I think the writers gave us probably more freedom than, than they would most, most shows. We get on set, we work it out, we read it, we sort of block it out. Blocking is when you just sort of, you know, for those that don't know, you decide where all the characters are going to stand, where the cameras are going to be. But then, but then we make adjustments. For example, one that I know that people would love to hear about is how did you end up throwing the Red Queen from Game of Thrones out the window? Like, we, we, you know, that that wasn't the original concept. There was a slightly different concept, and it's something that we sort of we talked about. And you, you find something else. And, and the writers were always great. How many guys were great to letting us sort of, you know, play oh, that way? But in the end, it was my ego. I mean, you have this <laughs> unbelievable actor, and as it was written, I come through the window and shoot her, and kill her. And I looked at John. I went, I don't get to have a scene with her. I don't get to talk to her. I don't get to do anything. <laughs> No, 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 no. Uh, and, and as it stands, the episode's too long. So there's all these very other factors. factors. And I went, no, 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 that's, that's not possible. I, I have to have a scene with her. She's, she's fantastic. I at least want to be able to say I've worked with her. <laughs> <laughs> so it's my ego. So we did a few lines. She's the strongest, shortest person you've ever met in your life. She's uh, wiry. I remember trying to wrestle her, and I said, you know, no, 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 I'm going to do it. And so I never actually got 
not that scene with her because I spent the entire time just trying to hold her still. <laughs> she is unbelievably strong. Uh, so by the time I actually chucked her out the window, I was quite happy. <laughs> So everybody is in the queue will easily get in for the next panel. Uh, I don't know where everyone is, but I guess programming in Ballroom 20 isn't too strong today. Oh well, didn't get into that one. Uh, it was full. It was started by the time I got down there. So uh, it doesn't really matter how much I've got a CQ for something the other one, so that's fine. Um, Under the Dome is in there next in Ballroom 20. I don't actually know what that is. It's some... It's a new TV, no it's not a new TV show, it's in the second season, but I've never seen it. And then afterwards is a world premiere of Scorpion, it's a new TV show. So I might go back in and see that, they're showing the, the pilot episode and then doing a Q&A. Nice being in here with the aircon. 
Zone. It was, I, I really want to do that Assassin's Creed thing, but it is so warm out today, I just can't face queue in that long. I don't mind the long queue, just not in this heat. So um, the interactive zone is, for some reason, a bit more bearable. There's a bit of a breeze blowing from here. And there you go, free slice of pizza. No idea what that is. I'm going to do that little swim. I'm going to head back to the convention centre. There's a, an author's panel on at 4 o'clock. Um, I try to get into But uh, I'll come back here tomorrow, probably. Well, I didn't get into that panel either. Uh, I left it a bit late, I knew I was getting a bit, or I was getting into line a bit late for it. But I've seen Pat Rothfuss uh, outside, I didn't get talked to him or anything, but I, I mean, I've seen him do talks before, so I wasn't that disappointed. And at least I was only in the queue for about 30 minutes before we realised we weren't going to get in um, instead of two hours, which I've done plenty of times for Ballroom 20. So that's the end of panels for today. <clears throat> I have a ticket for Woodstock, and that's where I'm heading now. Last year, I missed the opening act of Woodstock, which was probably the best surprise of the entire thing. It was when uh, Paul and Storm were singing about George R. R. Martin, and he came out on stage and smashed their guitar. I missed it. So I'm going to be there in plenty of time this year. Uh, yep, yeah, so Balboa Theatre, and I may not say to the end this time, it's a very, very long, I think I said this last year, it's a really long show. And last year it did seem to go by pretty fast, but it wasn't as tired as it was, or as I am now. So I'll see how I'm going at uh, the intermission. But it'll probably, let's see if something, yeah, it'll probably go on for about four hours. So, right, Woodstock, let's see what this is like this year. When we started, we were six Woodstocks younger than we are now, and we've come so far together. How many of you are attending Woodstock for the first time? Right here.
it turned into a sort of a classic. We found a blind man. the end of Thursday at Comic Con. It, it feels like Saturday. Um, it feels like a very long day for some reason. I didn't get an awful lot of sleep last night so I'm tired and yeah just have the energy um, that I usually have at Saturday of a convention. But uh, so Woodstock was actually really good. I uh, survived it all. Um, I'm glad I stayed at the end as well. I was considering leaving halfway through but uh, is the guy who does the oatmeal, is it Matthew Inman? I think it's Matthew S. Whoever it is anyway, who draws the oatmeal comic came out and did it a little bit and it was great. There was a few other acts in the second half that were really good as well. So glad to stay to the end. Um, uh, and one thing that happened at Woodstock that I'm really glad I was there for was Will read uh, one of my favourite stories of his, uh, Blue Light Special. So I'm going to play a little bit of it here, but I'm going to link to a video of the full story. Um, and I was further away here, so the footage isn't as good as last year, but uh, you'll probably be able to Google, well, every, everything at Woodstock will go online. You'll be able to see it all online, that's why I didn't bother taking a lot of video. Uh, and the story is called Blue Light Special. 
If someone asked you what toy to find your childhood, what would you say? My kids would say Game Boy if you asked Ryan, and Micro Machines if you asked Nolan. My brother would say NES, my sister would say Cabbage Patch Kids. My dad would say baseball cards. My answer comes without a moment's thought or second guessing. Star Wars figures. They were affordable, they were easily available uh, at Kmart, and they allowed me to create my nine-year-old version of fan fiction, <laughs> reenacting scenes from my most bestest movie ever, or making up my own. My core cast was Han Solo in the Hoth and regular outfits, <laughs> Luke Skywalker in the X-Wing fighter or Bespin outfits. That Bespin outfit was really great because it had a removable lightsaber that you could take out of Luke Skywalker's hand and lose the first time you played with it in the back. <laughs> My Greedo never got a fucking chance to get off a shot, goddammit. <laughs> Obi-Wan Kenobi, I lost the, pro the plastic robe and broke the tip off the lightsaber version. <laughs> Princess Leia, I really want to hit that, but I don't really know what that means, but it makes me feel weird in my boner area. <laughs> C-3PO tarnished paint peeling version. R2-D2 had stopped clicking a long time ago version. They spent a lot of time, these people, fighting on Tatooine, the torn cardboard backdrop version. Anybody get the Hoth playset and realize it was just a repaint of the Tatooine set and you were like, this is bullshit! <laughs> and then we saw the Phantom Menace and realized that maybe we should get upset at different parts of Star Wars for different reasons. <laughs> they flew around while crammed into a TIE fighter, the one wing really wants to fall off version. <laughs> while rolling around the kitchen floor in my land spetter, the keep you hands of it OLs version. I loved my Star Wars figures. I took them everywhere with me. I never owned one of those official carrying cases that looked like C-3PO, but they traveled with me in a van shoebox that could double as a rebel base whenever the need arose. And afterwards, I uh, went down to the Geek and Sundry party, or tried to get into the Geek and Sundry party, but like everything, once it's run for a year or two and the word gets around, it gets really popular. So the queue to get in there was down the road and round the corner. Um, and it wasn't moving, so that didn't happen. Um, and yeah, I uh, just grabbed myself a subway and I'm heading back to the hotel now to edit, render and upload today's vlog. I'm trying to stay on top of them, because if I get behind I'll never catch up before the end of the convention anyway. So yeah, that's it for Thursday of uh, Comic Con 2014.